Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, last commission meeting of this this council. Um, apologies for absence. I have none. Um, I I hope it, it will be apologies for lateness from Councillor Dehaney and welcome Councillor McLean joining us remotely. Hope commiserations, uh, Nick, on your you know testing positive. Um, declarations of pecuniary interest. There being none, and the minutes of our previous meeting, um, I've asked for one addition in the item on repurposing the high streets. Um, at the end, I want to add the sentence that will read, the chair explained that only the summary of the report had been circulated. The report to cabinet includes sections on each of the five high streets plus the SWOT analysis, as otherwise it uh, doesn't make clear that what's gone to cabinet is in fact the full report and not the, the, the somewhat um, summary version that you saw. So that apart, are people happy with the accuracy of the minutes? Okay, thank you. So, in a reversal of the order I gave you just a moment ago, <laughs> Peter, I'm going to ask you to uh, to lead on on your item, and hopefully the, the borough commander will be joining us shortly. Peter, can I ask you to just take five minutes to introduce it and allow plenty of time then for for questions and discussion? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good evening, councillors. Um, so uh, I'm Peter Clifton, um, Interim Head of Service for Safe Merton. Um, the report, um, which is the uh, uh, report providing an update on antisocial behaviour, uh, looks at the overall patterns and trends in terms of antisocial behaviour and also what Safe Merton, the council and the partnership has been doing to tackle antisocial behaviour. Uh, there's a number of sections. The first summarizes some of the feedback we've received from residents through the consultation activity, um, from which it's clear that antisocial behavior is a, is a, uh, a significant concern um, for local residents, as is the case across uh, most boroughs in, in London. Um, the second section looks at the antisocial behavior data, um, including looking at the increase in volume of reports we've seen in antisocial behavior uh, cases from residents during the pandemic period. Um, and we, although the uh, monthly level of reports has dropped somewhat from the, the peak that we saw uh, during last year, uh, it still hasn't come down yet to the pre-pandemic periods. The third section looks at what we've been doing to tackle antisocial behavior. That is very much a multi-agency approach um, it looks at the work which goes on at the Community Marac panel and the Locations board, board, which bring together a range of partners, including police, including different services across the council, including the probation service, health services, social care, to tackle both individual cases of antisocial behaviour um, and also look at locations which emerge as hotspots of antisocial behaviour. Um, there's also a breakdown of specific partnership activity which has been taking place that includes over 1500 reports of antisocial behavior investigated by the safer merton team over 60 cases referred to the community marac for multi-agency problem solving work how we've been using cctv to help tackle and reduce antisocial behavior that's included putting some additional cameras in antisocial behavior hotspots and environmental crime hotspots um, over 29% of incidents captured by our CCTV cameras relate to either antisocial behaviour or environmental crime, and that's helping provide evidence for enforcement action. We also look at some of the tools and powers and enforcement powers we've been using, including the community protection notices and enforcement within the public space protection order, which is focused on alcohol-related antisocial behaviour. Um, and the report also provides some details on some of the work with the Met's Designing Out Crime team to uh, implement uh, crime prevention measures. Um, for example, on the Phipps Bridge estate, um, which is currently, that work's currently being evaluated at the moment. 
um, and also the ongoing work at Wandle Park looking to implement safety improvement measures. Um, there's also information on the community engagement activity, the uh, 400 plus neighbourhood watchers form a significant part of that, as do all of the police safer neighbourhood teams, each one of which has antisocial behaviour as one of their priorities. There are six case studies included, which range from um, use of enforcement powers, use of CCTV, community engagement and designing out crime work uh, as well. And then the final section outlines the next steps, which will be uh, which will form much of the focus of the work of Safe and Merton in the year ahead um, to make sure that we continue to deliver a multi-agency response to antisocial behaviour, which seeks to reduce the risk to victims, prevent and deter antisocial behaviour from occurring, and take enforcement action against people responsible for antisocial behaviour. Um, I must conclude, uh, councillors, by uh, drawing your attention to an error and apologising for that error. Um, that is at point one, point three, four, page 21. I'll just give a, a moment uh, for you to turn to that page. It's on the table that provides the, uh, the data on the London ambulance call-outs for alcohol-related calls. Um, and the uh, labels in the first column are the wrong way around. So it's actually um, the wards in the PSBO, which should be in the bottom row of that table, and they did not see an increase in the call outs. It's the wards outside the PSPO which saw the increase. So I'm sorry for that, that error, and I'll make sure it's included in the uh, errata. Um, and uh, that concludes the summary. So, of course, happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, I thought you were going to point out on uh, the, the error in. Uh, mistaking biannual when you really meant biennial but uh so i would point out that our our annual residence survey takes place every two years although we called it that for some reason uh, and both surveys are in fact conducted once every two years not not twice a year but that apart Okay, I know I'm an old pedant. Um, questions for, for, for Peter, or points you'd like to discuss? Let me, Sally, please. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I just got it highlighted and I, it, it's to do with um, the fines you charge you talk on page 22, 1.42, and you then cite incidences of um, November, a van. So are these people who you caught, my question is, are these people who you caught? And I know on the Wandle Road, Willow Lane rather, where I sometimes walk the dog, I've seen people fly tipping, too frightened, my friend and I too frightened to challenge these two men, but supplied the registration number and the van and what they dumped but never heard back from anything so I don't know if you follow up issues like that and so are you do not take an indi individual's report is one question and the other one is the cases you listed were they fined and if they are fined what do you do with this money generated from the fines? How is it used? Is it used to further develop CCTV and such like? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so so for, for clarity, the um, enforcement of fly tipping and environmental uh, offences takes place under the um, public spaces team and their enforcement team, um, not, not Safe and Merton. Um, but Safe and Merton seeks to support that work by where there are hotspots that are identified for fly tipping, putting in temporary cameras to try to increase the probability of um, catching some footage that can be used as evidence. We then provide that footage to the enforcement team within public spaces. Um, I believe in terms of those examples listed, enforcement action was taken. Um, usually that would be, that would involve uh, a fine 
Um, I don't know in relation to those specific cases, the, the exact details of that. Um, overall, the public spaces team um, for littering and, and fly tipping, um, the, the amount of fines that they issue across the borough in a year is in, is in the, the thousands. Um, but for some of the fly tipping hotspots, it can be quite difficult to catch the perpetrators. Um, so that's why we seek to support that with the, with the CCTV. Um, and one further thing I, I should mention is we've recently, um, we've got eight additional uh, redeployable cameras. So we'll be looking to install some of those in some of the fly tipping hotspots to help with that work as well. So Chair, if I could just, so the money, the income that comes in from fines, is that used to further develop? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that, but I can take that back to my colleagues in public spaces and, and come back to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Peter, for your <coughs> report. Um, this uh, £1.2 million upgrade of our CCTV camera network, what, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, we're changing old cameras for new cameras? Does it mean we're getting more cameras in, you know, places that are needed? Because previously, uh, when I've asked um, about a particular um, location where anecdotally I'm aware of uh, a large number of antisocial behaviour sort of incidents. Uh, we've had a camera located there for a short amount of time. Uh, the incident sort of uh, antisocial incidents have uh, decreased, presumably deterred by the camera. The camera's then, you know, it's considered a success. The camera's then moved away. And I've been told that that's because the, obviously the camera's needed somewhere else. Uh, with the camera now having been moved away, that area's once again become a, you know, a place where um, um, certainly a number of young women have told me that they don't feel safe using this particular, you know, bridge. Um, so I, I suppose I'm asking about this 1.2 million upgrade. Is it about old cameras being replaced uh, with new cameras or is it more cameras? And how have you, uh, how are you confident that that's the best use of that money for the CCTV? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I, I would start off with, with the context. I think we, we, we have got a very effective CCTV service. They capture um, around three and a half thousand incidents a year and of which around that results in around 600 pieces of evidence either being shared with police or different teams in the council um, for investigation or enforcement. Um, but the equipment is, is aged, it is old. Um, and so it could be you know, even more effective than it is. So a lot of the upgrade is around renewing that, not sorry, not renewing, that's misleading, is around replacing that equipment, equipment, that old equipment with new technology, analog cameras with the digital cameras, um, not just the cameras, but the network as well that connects the, uh, the cameras. That may involve an increase in the uh, use of, of wireless technology, for example, as opposed to simply um, hard fiber. That also lends itself then to increase in flexibility in terms of where we can deploy the cameras um, at a sort of more economical, uh, cost. Um, so part of it is, or a lot of the upgrade is about coming up to date with the latest uh, cameras. There'll be uh, better definition, better quality, better evidence capture, but it's also an opportunity for us to look at the disposition of the cameras across the borough. Are they in the right place? Do we need to sort of move and adjust? Um, and finally, it's also about increasing the, um, in terms of the, the type of cameras, um, you've got this, your sort of permanent fixed cameras, but then you also have the more deployable ones that you can put up on lampposts, for example. Part of this upgrade will be about increasing the number of those <coughs> deployable ones because we find them tactically very useful to address exactly the sort of issues you're raising, where they're needed, when they're needed to try and, and have that impact. Um, and it, you know, it, is a, it is a fixed resource, but if we can increase that and actually help reduce crime and antisocial behavior at more locations that's what we want to do um, that has already um, started with um, the eight additional cameras I mentioned which will be going up in the uh, in, in the in the next sort of uh, two or three months um, but then there'll be more that follow throughout the course of the upgrade many people think that employing cameras particularly for flight tippers 
will solve the problem overnight. And I always say to people, look, there's a cost involved. And because we have experienced cuts in our budgets, we can't just put cameras everywhere. Now, is it a question of cost? Why, you know, there are not enough cameras around? Or, you know, it is a difficulty in operating them when you put them up. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, certainly, um, I think that, you know that there, there's a there's a, a balance in terms of um, in terms of costs and, and also in terms of the desirability of of um, you know you could go too far and, and and have sort of you know try to have cameras everywhere that would come at a extreme you know high financial cost. But also, there's implications to think of in terms of the proportionality of having that surveillance everywhere. So. Um, what we want to do is make sure we've got the, the, the assets that we've got, the cameras that we've got in the, in the right places, in the best places. Um, and that's why we look at the crime data and we look at the antisocial behaviour data. Um, we look at uh, whatever information we, we can to try to understand these are the locations most in need of, of, of the cameras. Um, the 1.2 million investment, I think, um, will help us be even more effective in terms of how the CCTV works. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Peter, for your report. Um, I've got three quick, uh, hopefully quick follow-up questions for you. On your on building off Billy's question, um, I was I'm hoping can you just expand on? I mean, you did a, you gave us a great answer on kit, but can you expand what capability this actually will give us? Um, I just want to understand, um, you know, what what that does. Um, if there's any um, server side improvements or any software improvements as well, that'd be helpful to understand. In terms of how that helps us um, use these images to um, catch culprits and, and link A to B together. Um, second question on, on normalization of data. I mean, it's really, really helpful to have this in terms of reports by ward, but given the populations of, of every ward is slightly different and given the number of reporting and the propensity report is slightly different, what methods have you used to normalize the data so that we're looking at apples and apples rather than comparing apples and pears? And um, sec and lastly, you referenced task and finish groups on page 14, um, and you talked about ad hoc groups set up. Are they all, how are they doing? Is there a program sort of uh, rag rating for them? You know, it'd be just great to just add some flavors to that. Certainly, Councillor, thank you. Um, in terms of the um, the difference, the upgrade will will make for the capabilities of the cameras. Um, probably, you know, the, the main one is the improved definition of the footage, improved quality. That will help with identification of suspects. That will help with better quality of, of evidence that can then be more effective at securing convictions. And the other aspect I would say is um, the, the sort of the the fact that they will it will be easier to deploy cameras to locations more flexibly because we'll be able to make you more use of the wireless technology so that can mean a quicker sort of turnaround in terms of getting a camera in and it can also mean lower costs per camera um, if you've got a sort of hotspot to deploy to um, the question in relation to the normalization of data um, the ward data you see in there isn't normalized for population um, that's something i'll be happy to take away and, and sort of do a piece on that um, to provide that, that normalised data, which uh, should, should hopefully be informative. Um, and in relation to the ad hoc um, task and finish groups, problem solving groups, they report back to either the community MARAC if it's in relation to an individual case or to the locations board if it's in relation to a hotspot. So they don't just sort of you know, um, sit alone and, and nobody's got that oversight of them. Um, and I think um, what I've seen over the last six months, I'm seeing increasing signs of positive outcomes from those task and finish groups. Um, we've seen uh, recent examples in Mitcham, for example, where there were unlicensed music events taking place and we saw good swift partnership action um, supported by police, supported by the Safe Merton team, um, planning enforcement and environmental services team. Um, two recent occasions where they acted swiftly and got positive results. Um, and, um, and that's just two examples, but I would say generally I'm seeing increasingly positive results from those task and finish groups. Could I come to Mansour, your, your question, please. Mansour. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Peter, for the summary. Uh, as per the CSS report, graffiti and vandalism, which are 42%, were the top types of antisocial behavior concerns. 
my question is that what is the present situation of this uh, vandalism and graffiti and how, what is what measures modern has taken to reduce this in, in terms of the top uh, types of antisocial behavior concern um, looking at the cases that uh, were reported to um, to, 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 the, to the Safe and Merton team. Um, general sort of ASB within a location, uh, which, which is uh, termed as area misuse, was one of the main uh, types, and that could include um, uh, people setting fireworks, groups gathering, uh, being disorderly. Um, often we saw a link being made to um, concerns around alcohol-related antisocial behaviour, or uh, also drug-related antisocial behaviour um, as uh, as well, um, but it, it it can it can sort of there's a wide range uh, of issues that can the reports can take. We did notice during the lockdown period there was an increase in reports relating to neighbourhood disputes, and that's somewhat different from the sort of the, the town centre antisocial behaviour that I've just described. Um, and quite a few of the cases that are worked on in the community Marac um, recently have involved those neighbourhood disputes. So hopefully that, that gives a bit of a flavour, Councillor. Thank you. Your question. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Pierre. Um, there's a point in the uh, next steps page on 28 that's that's about the direct casework support for victims and it's prompting me to ask a bit about um how things are communicated with the public um either the direct victims of um and social behavior um any follow-up with them uh, what are the kind of uh, main strategies in the partnership that you do if there's it, broad examples you can give that would be useful um but also when there are aren't direct victims are, are there any communications when there has been a particularly uh, big or um significant event on, on a street or in an area um about letting the residents know there that you're at least you know about it um and then perhaps um a couple of things about what you're doing and i suppose a, a, se a separate but connected part of that is um you, you speak a little bit here about um either vulnerable individuals that are at risk of um, being victims of antisocial behavior um, or severe effects of it, or um, there's an allusion here to actual taking part in antisocial behavior. So communication in general, but to all these different parts, if you could just go through a, a, that a little bit for me, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I would say th this is very much one of the key functions of the Community Marac multi-agency panel. Um, it brings together a range of partners, partly because that can then help with getting the right support uh, and advice um, and engagement around the victim of antisocial behaviour. Sometimes that can be as simple as sign signposting the victim to support services, for example, victim support, which as well as working with victims of crime, also work with victims of antisocial behaviour. Um, sometimes it might um, involve working with um, social care in terms of if there's safeguarding needs or, or care needs that may need uh, support and also working with our partners in the voluntary community and faith sec sector, for example, MSIL, um, who are also part of our, our community merit process um, and whether the case is being led by Safe and Merton antisocial behaviour officers, they would have close engagement with the victim, as would be the case when the police are leading on a case. And again, the Safer Neighbourhood team officers working on that case would have close engagement with the victim. And through the community MARAC, we try to make sure that victims don't sort of fall through the, the net, so to speak, in terms of that work and support. Um, in terms of area-based issues um I, I think that's an area we can we can do more on in safer merton and, and get better at in terms of getting that communication out there um also about some of the when we take action and, and based on the concerns that residents have put through to us um i think we can do more to get that that those good news stories out there that we we're listening we are acting and we're we're we're, we're, we're doing stuff to tackle the issues um i know the police do a tremendous amount of work in each of the 20 wards um in terms of that area-based victim engagement there's ward panels on every ward um, and that's a key part of the of, of the safe and able team's work is, is having that sort of link um, with the uh, with those local communities uh, 
Thanks for this, Peter. Um, I'm looking at the graph from page nine and putting the first lockdown period to one side. Uh, this year, we're still something like 50% higher in ASB reports than we were two years ago. Is that still COVID issues, lockdown issues, or, or are there other e things happening here? And how do we relate to other boroughs in, in, in that? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I would say, no, it's, it's not, not COVID um, issues. And I know in terms of the, um, I, I won't sort of speak I suppose in too much detail around around the, the police reports, uh, other than to say that certainly during the um, pandemic period, the lockdown periods, a lot of the increase seen in the police reported ASP figures were linked to COVID type breaches being reported. Um, but Safer Merton itself, the council itself, saw an increase in ASB reports that weren't necessarily related to breaches, but was perhaps related to neighbourhood disputes, and some of that seemed to be perhaps because of the changes in, in sort of lifestyles that were happening, people were perhaps um, uh, sort of bumping into each other a lot more, you know, as, as neighbours and, and being in, 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 in their, their sort of uh, their streets or, or their house a lot more than, more than they were. Um, we've, while we've seen the level of reports fall back from the peak that it was at, as, yes, as you say, it hasn't fallen back to the pre-pandemic levels. Um, and from what I'm seeing, it doesn't seem to be connected to COVID related stuff per se. Um, and I'm not sure the exact reason is why it hasn't fallen back. One possible hypothesis I have is that um, one of the uh, things that happened during the pandemic was that a lot of people were more in contact or more aware of the work the local authorities were doing um, than they might otherwise have been. And that might be resulting in an increased likelihood for people to reach out and, and contact the local authority. But the, 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 the honest answer there is I'm not 100% sure, but that's something we'll certainly be, uh, be looking at and trying to understand better. Um, I question peter on on case study number one which is interesting which is about a um the family from held moving in on the street um and it's interesting that they didn't respond to initial warnings and it's only when you got on to actually prosecuting if i've understood this correctly that the the, the behavior changed i mean that that i suppose the point there is that there is a cost attached to escalating that isn't there and, and why don't people respond to an initial warning or uh, that might sound a naive question but anything you can tell us around that would be interesting thank you councillor um certainly and i think we we, we we try to be proportionate with with our enforcement and and try to use the you know the least powerful tool which will do the job and then if it's not then escalate accordingly um and in fact, in, in many cases, the initial warning, whether it's a community protection notice warning or on the police side, an ASB first stage warning, it often does the job um, and, uh, and, and is effective. Uh, and then it's only a sort of small minority of those cases that then perhaps the issue persists and you need to escalate to the next level. Um, that, that may be why this one was selected as a case study, because it had that feature about it that perhaps made it more, more interesting, but, but sort of beneath that pyramid, if you like, there's many more cases where there was one initial warning and then that, that, that helped resolve the issue. I've got, I've got one last point thought here is, is that it seems to be maybe ASB reports were as much symptomatic of how people feel as um, an actual increase in the number of objectively determined incidents of ASB and if, if we look at the um, the annual residence survey so so it's called it is apparent that people are in some respects more jittery and less happy about their lives and the um, well, the figure I picked out the number who claimed to be, feel anxious yesterday went from eight percent to twenty percent um, and conversely, the number who were happy yesterday went down. So in, the, in light of what's happened over the last two years, I, I think we, we do still have a rather more um, damaged society than perhaps we, we have yet uh, fully acknowledged. Do, do you think ASB reports are partly symptomatic of how people are feeling about life? 
I, I think it's very plausible that, that that may be the case. And I think you're, you're quite right to, to point out in terms of it's, um, you, we often have to be cautious about interpreting a simple increase or decrease, and it may not necessarily simply be um, reflective of the prevalence changing to that degree. It could be around how confident people are to report or people's thresholds for, for tolerance of, of, of issues in terms of antisocial behavior type issues, or indeed, you know, they're, they're um, I, I suppose, for example, conducting an activity like raising awareness about the work of the Safe and Murden Partnership and the, and the police, and um, that may result in more, in more reporting, for example. So there's lots of, of causes and, and effect. Um, and I think that that's certainly something um, in, in terms of what, what, what effects we're still seeing in society from what we've been through over the last uh, couple of years with the, the pandemic. I think that's something that not just Safe and Merton, but the local authority more broadly, and I'm sure policing, uh, and other partners as well will want to look at, um, continue, continue to look at closely and try and understand what's behind those trends. So if we have no more questions for Peter, let me just, just thank you. I think we, it's clear you're going to continue to be busy. Um, <laughs> so we would appreciate you continuing to come to, to make reports to this, this body. Peter, you've got a Chair, um, I don't have a question, but a comment, and, and it is that um, over the years I've been a, a member of this authority, I've, I've tried to help a number of local residents who have problems um, with antisocial behaviour, and I think it's really important that we acknowledge the hard work uh, of the team that are involved in this work, and thank them uh, because they can make a huge difference. Uh, and you know, this really does affect the lives of citizens in a in a really detrimental way, to the point where they are, you know, their their health is and can be affected. Uh, and I think, uh, as a local authority, we are um, lucky to have such a team, and uh, we should express our gratitude whenever we can. Thank you indeed. Yeah, quite so. It, it is, uh, we do know that ASV does affect people in, in, in quite profound ways, and, and we do need to do all we can to, to, to keep on top of it. And it is an uphill task, I think. But uh, so thank you for what you're doing. Good. Um, so let me move on and thank the Borough Commander for joining us on, a, on an inhospitable evening. Thank you, Lise, for coming along. Can I ask you first to, to give us a, a, a brief update on what's been going on in your world, and then we'll, we will take the, the written questions, see if people have any supplementaries to those. Yeah, okay. good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Chair. So, um, yeah, so it's been, um, <laughs> I, I think most of what's been going on has been rehearsed um, in the press recently. Um, but locally, um, I think we're in a fairly good place. So there's been some really uh, nice crime reductions uh, figures in some really important areas. Um, we'll come on to it later, but there are obviously areas for improvement, particularly around our detection rates. We've had a fairly good period where we haven't um, lost many officers to uh, police protests in central London. I know we've talked about that before. So um, most of the officers are, um, have been on the BCU and in Merton, and we've been able to, as we've discussed before, fill the many um, of the neighbourhood positions and schools officer positions as well. So I think we're in a fairly healthy place. I suppose the um, counterbalance to that, though, is that um, you'll have seen that we're recruiting heavily and there's questions in the pack around the 20,000 um, officers. So what that means is it gives us a lot of inexperienced officers who are taking us quite a long time uh, to get up to speed. But I'm happy to take questions um, and answer in more detail on the questions in the pack and also um, answer on anything anyone may have read in the press and may have uh, concerns about. Thank you, Chair. So if we take take the, the the written questions and answers, and as, as mine came up first, let me just ask: um, initiatives such as walk and run and talk, that sounds like a two stages of multitasking too far <laughs> for me. But how, how's that working out? What what's your target audience for that? And and, and uh, is it is it actually working? You've got officers 
fit enough to keep up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, crikey. I won't, I won't um, start uh, talking to you about my ultra running because it might put people to shame. But um, yes, no, so we, um, we've been doing uh, walks and talks. Actually, all the boroughs in London have been doing them, and it's to address um, the issues in the violence against women and girls strategy. So what we find is that if officers and um, community members get to know each other as people and they're out in their local area, then that builds confidence in policing in those individuals and also in people that see them interacting. So um, actually every borough has got uh, a walk and talk scheme which is advertised on Eventbrite. But um, just to be different, uh, Sarah Dobinson, your neighborhood inspector, organized a uh, talk and run um, where she was doing um, park runs and other runs with people that were interested. So just a little bit of um, borough one upmanship, I think. You had a, a, a written question. Do you, do you want to follow up on that or are you happy with the answer you got? Well, I think the answer, Chair, is that um, uh, the BCU commander doesn't know. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I Which I, question is this? Well, this is in... Sorry, it's in relation to... Oh, you asked about the comparative... Yes. For, for, for the 2010. For 2010. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't. It wasn't um, easy to to find those figures, and it didn't seem kind of proportionate to spend much time doing it. But you're, you know, if you're if you're trying to make the point that there were um, a lot more neighbourhood officers in the past, you're absolutely right. There were um, our, our current model, um, which follows the mayoral promise, is just to have those two dedicated ward officers and the PCSO um, in each ward. Um, what I think is really encouraging, because neighbourhood policing is really important to me, is that in all of the um, commentary coming out, for example, the strategic review of policing, the police foundation report, um, it all really emphasises the importance of neighbourhood policing. So I do think that we might see a rise, but of course it's, um, it's you know, police officer numbers in themselves are a, a very political um, issue. Chair, if I, if I could continue with my supplementary it was to say uh, would it surprise you uh, to to learn that um, there were double the number of officers uh, on the ground in Ravensbury ward at that time no it wouldn't no i think the model was called 321 yeah no absolutely and i um if if it were up to me i would um have that tomorrow um, but unfortunately, we're not resourced for that. And, um, you know, 20, 20 wards in Merton, 74 across the BCU. Uh, those are extra officers that I, I don't have, unfortunately. Well, I, I thank you for confirming what m my memory was telling me. Um, and I think, um, you know, you've said that you, if it were up to you, um, you would, would have them back. I think I'd like to advise you that if it were up to the residents of Ravensbury Ward, they too would like to see you with increased resources. I've got a number of questions from the Conservative group. Uh, I don't know whether they're evidence of group think. Does, are there any, Thomas, any, any points you want to follow through there? On, yeah, on, there's, a, on, there's a couple I'd follow up on. Um, and then uh, Nick may have some as well. Um, just on the the answers on the uh, theft of, of bikes and catalytic converters, um, do you have, you, obviously you mentioned hotspots in the answer and you, you may not be able to go into too much detail, but is that a sort of borough-wide problem? Uh, sorry, thinking the catalytic converters rather than the bikes particularly, um, is that a borough-wide problem or is that something that's being seen in, in certain areas? And also, I know particularly in, in some wards, in my own ward included, there's been a lot of work with the Safer Neighbourhood team in terms of um, making people aware of the carless key theft as well of you know, um, cars parked on, on drives that are being taken. Just wondered if you could give a, an update on, on how that's gone, because I know there's been a lot of activity in terms of um, both giving people the means to, to prevent that, but also just to, to raise the information. So if you'd, yeah, both, both of those would be helpful, please. Yeah, so um, 
the you know the, the catalytic converter thefts across the BTU and in Merton are concentrated in areas that are more affluent than other areas, and typically the organised criminal groups that um, are carrying out these thefts go from pocket to pocket. So we typically find that um, a particular areas aren't usually repeat venues often. But as you say, our, you know our best weapon is uh, crime prevention. So um, in addition to uh, the packs that we can get from the manufacturers with this additional bolt essentially to bolt on the catalytic converter, we also do operations where we go and visit scrap metal dealers, where we know that they would um, be a market for that. So that's helpful. And also, um, you know, there's lots of other related theft as well. So um, theft of number plates um, is fairly typical as well. So um, now the manufacturers are developing, again, this different kind of tamper proof screw. And so we've been doing um, a number of, um, you know, kind of free free kits for those across the a borough and BCU. And as you say, bite marking as well. So they, these are the, the tools that we have, as well as obviously trying to disrupt the organised criminal groups, but they're working across London, so it's, it's quite difficult to predict where they might be. Thank you. That's helpful to just uh, bouncing around the subjects. But the, um, the answer about the um, particular locations where women feel unsafe in the borough, um, just when it... it um, Appreciate your examining the data. Um, do you were you able to give an indication when you might be able to kind of report back on that at some point? Yeah, so we're waiting for um, a fuller report from uh, the Home Office on the on the data they've got, which I understand is going to be April, and then we'll, we'll look at that further because um, although it's been reasonably well used and it can supplement the information that the council's got as well, it's still not um, necessarily rich enough in terms of figures to to give us um, as much information as we want. And then, and just, um, I've got some more figures for uh, vehicle crime and so on, if anyone needs those as well, but they're readily available. On the um, issue of, of where women feel unsafe, I commend the efforts of our ward PCO in Merton Park, not PCO, PCSO Nigel Sanders, who carried his own, out his own little survey and fed the information back um, which rather stacks up with, with what I've been told too, that we, we did find through that that certain of the the lanterns, as they are called, within um, the lights that have been fitted in the, quite recently actually, had, had failed, so that uh, some of our black spots were, were down to the mechanical mm -hmm. failure of, of the the lanterns fitted and they are now being replaced. So that, that was a useful mm -hmm. exercise, actually. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this report. Um, my, I was thinking uh, when the questions were submitted that my other question will be answered throughout. Um, so my question isn't directly related to this, um, so, I apologise, you're on your feet a little bit here, but um, there is an issue around confidence uh, that people feel about in the, in the police, which is related to, but not the same as, feeling safe. Um, and I realise, uh, I completely agree with uh, Councillor McCabe's points made earlier, and I, I get your difficulty in answering to that. Um, it seems you've also got a difficulty on the other side about um, conviction rates as well. Um, knowing that you've got that difficult part, where do you, are there a few points you can make about where you see your role in increasing the confidence? Because there are things you can do like those, you know, run and, and talks and things like that, which are useful, but are there things, um, strategies about your evidence taking, you know, in, in kind of bolstering your role so that others can do theirs even better in terms of conviction rates and things, things that you can communicate to the, community that you're you're doing as well as being visible and those are the strategies um that can help that confidence um yeah so where where are you gauging in confidence and how what are your strategies to be um in increasing that confidence? thank you okay um I, I don't know whether you've um have you ever looked at the public attitude survey 
because it gives quite a helpful framework um, to answer some of the, this question. So it talks about whether you feel that you can rely on your local police. It talks about whether you think they do a good job. It talks about whether you know how to contact them um, and, and those kind of questions. So we, so we use those questions almost to, to frame some of our activity. So I think, you know, we, we approach this exactly as you described really on, on two main fronts. The first front is that we want people to, um, if they need us, to feel confident in calling us, that they you know, would want our help, I suppose, for a better, better way of putting it. Um, and then the second thing that, that I, I believe will increase confidence over time and will, will be a kind of antidote to things that are being read in the press is to do a good job for victims. Um, because I, you know, that that is essentially what people want. Um, is that if they, you know, it's it's just customer service by any other name. So, and that's the bit that we've really struggled with, I think. And um, you know, there's some kind of systemic challenges around communication channels, um, like calling 101. It's not it's not a great service. And so, there's kind of different, yeah, diversification. I think is a better word of some of those communication channels to help people get the information they need sooner. So. Um, locally that's what we're really trying to focus on so we've got um five focus areas that we look at and one of the five is victim satisfaction which there's a separate victim satisfaction survey that that mopat do and the other one is, is confidence and i think um it, if we can flood um the community with stories about where things have gone well then that's going to be helpful but it is um it is a really difficult challenge at the moment with the things that um, are happening in other areas um, to, to maintain confidence. And I you know, fully understand people's concern and anger about some of the issues. Um, so I want to find some way of uh, acknowledging that and still allowing my officers to do a good job. Um, yeah. Well, just get this back on track. I'll take the um, written uh, questions and answers first. So, let Paul, I assume you're not going to go through every one. You're just going to. I'll go through every one. No, no, no. <laughs> Three I want to ask supplementaries on, please. Uh, on, on numbers, thank you for your response. Well, it is a bit delphic. I asked for officer and staff numbers separately. You've combined them. Are you able to give me the officer numbers and the staff numbers separately for those questions? Sorry, I did. I did I just... Sorry, this is page. This is my first question on police numbers what's what's um not do you mean by borough rather than by bcu or no no i'm an officer and i asked for the officer numbers and staff numbers you give me the combined figure from the in your predecessor you used to give us officer numbers oh, i see okay um sorry i i um read the question in a different way and read it as officers and staff <laughs> um but i can i can send you those figures certainly but you can you can assume that there is about uh off the top of my head probably about 200 staff of that number okay but it, it, you don't have to do now because if you could give me the exact figures that would be great mm -hmm. thank you well there are exact figures they're just as you say as you say combined but i can split those down yeah yeah thank you um well, just incidentally why do, why i'm very glad to see it but why do we have more staff than that than, than our plan complement is is that uh, just transitory stage or it's because it's ebbing and flowing every month i think so um at the moment we're um we're in a season where we're getting a number of new officers a month but with the attrition it would probably start um coming down but actually we do expect to see growth but the the planned complement um the blueprint numbers aren't done that regularly um so they're probably this one was probably done uh about a year after the bc was created so we we i you know i think it's great and that we should expect to see a new establishment number um being formed um probably from the first of april um that will then look at that if you see what i mean okay and with regard to to part d in that we, we were told at locations board there's a sort of bidding process across london whereby bcus were bidding for these extra police and we were told that our BC would only be successful in getting 30 in Kingston. Is, is that correct, or is, is it more complex than that? Yeah, I mean, it's more, it's, um, that's not quite right. It's, um, so we don't bid for, so if, if you take, take it back, so 20,000 new officers that were announced nationally, 6,000 of those um, coming to the Met, um, 
we're in the third year of that recruitment program and there are 1800 uh, officers left of that 6000 to recruit into the Met. We um, BCUs do not bid for those extra officers. Um, those are allocated um, just in terms of need and vacancies and also taking into account officer preference in terms of travel and so on. What we did bid for um, in a sense, um, was the town centre teams. So this was um, a complement of 650 officers across London that were already within our existing numbers, and they were allocated to be additional neighbourhood officers. And those officers were divided into two different lots. The first lot was town centre teams, and the second lot was additional dedicated ward offices for wards across London that were really particularly busy. And um, the a process was gone through an academic process. I'm sorry, I don't know my microphone's not very good. Um, an academic process was gone through and um, it looked at where the highest harm uh, places were in London that had an identifiable town centre. And our BCU um, was, um, our town, Kingston Town Centre was number 30 on that list. But the decision was made that every BCU would have at least one town centre team of the 30 town centre teams. And so um, we, got, um, we got one for the BCU. And I was not able to select where that went. It was just based um, on the basis of um, the figures. So it was Grave Ward in Kingston. Thank you. On, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand what's happening with regard to the ward panels and the neighbourhood teams. Are we going to 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 align them with the new ward boundaries or not? I, I, I asked this a year ago, locations board, and told that's what would happen. But is that what you're telling me in your answer? Yes, so it's always that's always been my intention locally because I don't see any other thing you know way forward apart from you know representing what's actually factually given you the case in terms of the new ward boundaries. Um, there's no point in us trying to pretend that that's not the case and have our officers elsewhere. Centrally, um, the discussions um, have been ongoing, um, but I believe that now they have come to a, the view that all BCUs will align their neighbourhood teams to the new ward boundaries. What hasn't uh, the agreement hasn't been reached on whether we'll get any additional officers for those um, new wards. So in some cases, in some areas of London, uh, you know, new wards are being formed, um, and the mayor has not made a commitment yet about whether the kind of mayor promise would continue to have two officers for each ward. But in the long story short, yes, we are reorganising for the new ward boundaries. Sorry to press you on this, I'm not clear because this isn't a London wide reorganization. This was just it was Merton's turn to have its boundaries redesignated. That was done. That was a year ago. We had that. I, what I don't understand is why it's not seamlessly done that within Merton, the, the war teams are now going to be aligned to the new boundaries. I don't understand how local democracy will work with ward panels and we don't have that from from this May, when we have the new council teams elected. So this is not a London-wide issue, it's just a Merton issue. No, it's a, it's, it's a London-wide issue and a Merton issue, so. It's not, because not all of London has had new new boundaries. Many, many boroughs have, many, yeah, many boroughs not, have, yes. Many haven't, but anyway, we've had that for a year. When are we going to actually align them? See, so we're aligning them at the moment. So they will be ready from May, because we were told our panel they wouldn't be. So from May, they will align, be aligned, will they? The neighbourhood inspectors have been asked to make that happen, yep. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and, uh, and my last question was, was related to Ben's, actually, on the other side of the coin. How, how is morale holding up with you, with, with it, within your teams, within the police, given, given all that's happening at the moment? Mm. Um, yeah, so, so morale um, is fairly low um because obviously um although uh there are lots of uh, bad things that have happened 
then the vast majority of officers are um, good and trying to do their best for the community. So it's very difficult, um, although they, as I said before, they understand uh, you know, how deeply people feel about things, then it's hard for them to read things that they don't feel apply to them. Um, but that, you know, that said, I, you know, their, their purpose for doing their job hasn't changed. They're still there to, you know, prevent and reduce crime and to help people. That's why they joined. So they have that strong sense of vocation that you wouldn't necessarily do in other professions. Um, so I think that's helpful. And obviously I'm doing all I can in terms of, um, you know, passing on any, any praise from, uh, from local people, um, making sure I award uh, borough commander commendations uh, and so on. Thank you. I just say I, I've had very good reports from from parents about these school officers oh. working. So that's worked very well. Good. Thank you. Come coming to general questions, Aidan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Elizabeth, for your work and for the work that your colleagues um, do. Um, it's really appreciated. Um, we talked a lot about the past and the present. I would like to sort of talk briefly about the future and to understand um, the, the thinking with you and your, your counterparts as well about the rise in uh, cost of living crisis and the effect that will have on crime, both the fear of crime, but also the reporting. And what, if, if any initiatives or, or thoughts collectively with partners have been put together about how to how to respond to that because a lot of what potentially we could see will be crimes of opportunity crimes of circumstance um and as as we know we've already talked about the the metal price and etc the markets will have a, a further impact on that it'd be great to hear um the conversations at the current thinking that is going on in that space yeah so um you know you're absolutely right so that there's lots of things that are um putting families into difficulty the you know the fuel crisis um uh, the war the, the the general kind of widening um social inequality um we acquisitive crime is still um heavily linked to the drug market for example as well as need um, so there are things that we can still continue to do to keep acquisitive crime down um, that doesn't necessarily involve the, the, the average person. Um, we're contributing to some work that's organised by MOPAC, which is um, London's anchor institutions network work, which you may be aware of. So um, that's bringing together, obviously, um, organisations that um, have a social responsibility across London and um, as well as um, as well as some of the more kind of strategic schemes there are schemes around uh, widening mentoring and it, it, you know importantly trying to enlist large numbers of corporates across London to offer apprenticeship and other job opportunities because we have to be able to offer an alternative um, what we're doing in the slightly um, shorter term in terms of diversion is we're making use of funds such as the Cognitive Behavioural Therapy Fund that, that's just been announced, um, which means that um, we can nominate young people who might otherwise be uh, involved in crime to um, essentially receive extra support uh, from partners. So um, it, is, it is something where we're very um, conscious of. And, and just from a kind of trust and confidence perspective, what I want to really make sure of is that we don't start um, over-policing um, certain communities compared to others. So I'm, I'm very aware of that. Thank you. Just a brief follow-up. It'd be good to, I mean, if you've, if, if you've got anything to, that you could circulate about that, the cognitive behavior oh, yeah. reference, that'd be fantastic to understand a bit further. And, and again, thank you very much for for this answer and all your other answers. Yeah, no, of course, I'll send that via Rosie. Yep. There's still a lot of complaints among local people that they never see a policeman on the road. You now the police ride these days, they don't walk. Wouldn't it be a good idea that they linger a bit <laughs> Instead of riding down the road, riding up. People see you, I mean, I never see a policeman on this road. I say, Yes, I see them there. He said, I don't see any. Always complaints, but they never see. What can you do to, yeah, can you do anything about that? Or just the way things are going to be? 
Yeah, so um, it's certainly a question that's off. <laughs> More police officers, yeah. Um, yes, that'd be lovely. Um, it's a question that is often answered. I, I think, um, you know, if you're a response team officer and you're driving around in your fast car with your blue lights flashing, um, and that does make you more visible um, than neighbourhood officers. Uh, you do have here, which I should have mentioned to um, the, in answer to the councillor's earlier question, you do also have a neighbourhood tasking team um, that are based out of Mitcham Police Station, who are doing some really, really good work for you here in the borough at the moment. And, and they um, are often um, out on the streets in addition to the neighbourhood officers. The difficulty we've got there, I'm afraid, is that um, they do about half of their uh, policing operations in uniform and half of them not in uniform. Um, however, I think the operations that are not in uniform, the days of those might be numbered because I understand that a lot of the local community who they might want to um, approach now knows who they are. So, um, <laughs> um, so it, it's, which is quite interesting. So I, um, I've been involved in a, a mentoring program with some young people working with Merton Council. Um, and it, it, it's gone it's gone really well actually so we've talked about perceptions of stop and search and how we can um, build trust and confidence and um, they they talk about um, seeing too many police officers and uh, know them all by name um, but I think um, coming full circle on that answer I, I would really like more neighborhood officers um, and so I undertook to fill the school's roles, the neighbourhood ward officer roles, which I've done. Um, and now, um, if I have any opportunity at all, I'll keep adding to that tasking team um, to, in to increase um, officers here. So, no more questions for the borough commander. Um, can I say that the, the, the more our borough commanders come to see us, the more we get to uh, more our confidence in them grows so i think w we do have a lot of confidence in 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 what you're doing your team in in pretty difficult circumstances which we greatly appreciate so, thank thank you chair and just um just to say i um i would really welcome having telephone calls from anyone in this room if there's anything that you want to chat over because I know that sometimes uh, the local teams are equipped with answers on some of the more strategic and resource based points and sometimes they aren't so I'm always happy to to answer those and I will make sure I break down the officer and staff members and get those sent over as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And do please, yes, uh, we do appreciate you coming along in person and we do appreciate you, you've got a wide remit so uh, giving us this amount of attention is is is. Uh, it, uh, much appreciated by us all. Thank you. Sally. Thank you, Chair. Can I just say to the Barrel Commander, you said you're happy to accept phone calls. I don't know that I have your number and I appreciate you can't give it out in a public meeting. Perhaps if you could e email it to Peter, who could share it with us. Would that be acceptable, please? Yes, very happy. So there we are. This is, I think, the um, shortest meeting I've I've ever chaired, <laughs> and uh, and I know whether it will uh, gladden the heart of my 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 vice chair, if not warm the cockles of his heart, because it is bloody freezing in here, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but it it was not intended to be as short as this. I have to to tell you that there were two um, items we should have been looking at: the equality and community cohesion strategy and the um, the overview and scrutiny annual report. So ending on a slightly grumpy note, I'm saying <laughs> I am handing on some unfinished business to my successor and I, I apologize for that. I don't like doing that. I would have liked to have had these things wrapped up within the life of this council, you know, um, and it, it's not not down to our hardworking frontline scrutiny officers. I think they haven't always had the level of support um, that would have been, would have helped them to do their, their, their job uh, properly. Um, so those of you who remain on, on the commission 
into the next council. Do please keep an eye on uh, on the work programme, make sure things are happening when they should. Um, you know, I do care about all this, but I have to pass it on to you now to make sure that uh, scrutiny continues to, to, to be an important function in the way we, we, we run the council here. It has been uh, uh, very important to, to, to me and it's, it, it's evolved in, in a lot of ways, some of them good, and it, it, it matters. It does make a difference to, to, to the life of our council and the way we, we govern ourselves. So, and, and the other thing, of course, if you haven't filled in that scrutiny survey, and I know lots of you did because you, you did that to help you get through the, the budget council meeting. Um, but if it is still outstanding, do, do please make sure they, that they come in because the response rate is still not good. So. Chair, um, I think it would be a remiss of us um, not thank all those members who are standing down, um, but uh, in, in this particular um, commission, uh, not to thank you for your um, very thorough and diligent and conscientious contribution uh, to the work of the council over many years. Uh, and um, yes, it's true, uh, I do, uh, uh, move through um, meetings at a, a different pace, but I appreciate uh, the, um, the extent to which you provide and have provided uh, members with the opportunity to really dig uh, and delve into the work of those that we are here to scrutinise. So uh, I will miss you, uh, and I would like to, on behalf of the Overview and Scrutiny Commission, thank you. Uh, and I think Ben's the, the only other member that I'm aware. Oh, John, you're, you're stepping down as well. So, I mean, I think we should um, thank all those members uh, for their contribution. And, um, you know, making the work of a councillor is difficult uh, and requires uh, long hours and, and the ability to withstand sub-zero temperatures um, uh, in meetings. And, and, and I think we are not always appreciated, uh, but I hope you three will feel appreciated this evening. So thank you. Thank you for those kind words, appreciate it. Yeah.